this conversation of Bitcoin mining, and I'm gonna to bring to the stage Elliot David, who is the head of climate strategy at the Sustainable Bitcoin Protocol. Elliot? Doing. How's everybody doing? Good? Everybody can hear us okay? Awesome. Excited to be the last uh, session of the day. Uh, thank you to the organizers of the conference for having us. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. We have three awesome co-panelists. Um, I know we're strapped for time, so why don't we just dive into introductions. If everybody could just uh, tell the audience about yourself, what you do, uh, how you operate in the mining space. Uh, I'm Jesse, I live in Cape Town, I'm from Germany. Um, I bring hash rate to Africa by connecting people to, en to energy and ASICs to energy and vice versa, and we'll leave it at that. I'm Ryan McLeod, uh, I'm a Bitcoiner from Canada. I work in the nuclear industry and I'm trying to advance small modular reactors by using Bitcoin mining as an anchor load to improve their economics. And uh, I'm Phil, hello. Yeah, I don't know if that was working. Sorry, I think Hello. it's working. Yeah, there we go. So, okay, All right. uh, I'm Philip from uh, Nairobi, uh, one of the co-founders of Gridless, and uh, we use Bitcoin mining to uh, uh, monetize stranded energy across the continent. Yeah. So I don't think the mic goes on for mine, but yeah, I'm just trying to advance small modular reactors with Bitcoin mining. Very cool. Uh, and I think we're going to dive into a little bit of what SMRs are, folks in the audience that aren't familiar with you know, small modular nuclear reactors. but. I think anybody here who's into Bitcoin mining is united by the vision that it's a powerful unlock tool for clean energy development, for energy access, internet access, a lot of like exciting sustainable development across the continent. Um, you know, I, I think before we saw in the session that about 1% of global hash rate is currently in the African continent. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of us would like to see more of that despite the fact that most of the actual use of and adoption of Bitcoin is happening here. So maybe we'll start off, you know, why do you guys think that there's this disconnect, kind of in your own words? Um, and then for folks in the audience, like, why, why is it important to mine Bitcoin in Africa? Uh, I'll, I'll kick it started. Um, I think it's perceived risk. That's the main thing. Uh, capital, mining is very capital intensive. If you want to run big operations, you need a lot of money and that money needs to come from somewhere. And then typically, the people who have the money to deploy will deploy it in less risky places, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's the main target, and it's also why, why I started my company, is to, to help people understand that risk and lower the perceived risk that's, that's there. That's, that's helpful, and I, I think we'll throw it to Phil. You know, Gridless, the sort of pioneering Bitcoin miner, um, Huge fan of the work you guys are doing. Uh, talk a little bit, like you guys are actually walking the walk, mining in Africa, connecting communities. Tell us, like, why do you see the disconnect? What was the vision for Gridless, for those in the audience that aren't familiar? Yeah, I mean, you know, it started for us uh, with this dialogue about why all of the renewable mini grids were failing financially uh, and what we could do to solve that. And, um, you know, when you think about Bitcoin mining, I mean, let's set aside some of the technical challenges, um, you know, with understanding like uh, large currents in energy and connections. I mean, there, there are some technical challenges there. You know, really the two things you need are power and connectivity. Um, and it turns out that the connectivity piece is pretty difficult, um, particularly in, in remote parts of Africa. And so, you know, when you look at the technical innovations that we've had to focus on as gridless to make mining productive and reliable, I would say connectivity has definitely been the, the number one challenge that we've had, uh, had to solve. Um, that and getting, you know, like um, we had a site, um, they had a, a power surge, blew all our surge arresters, you know, and then it's just this scramble to find the components you need in a location that doesn't normally have them. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's some of the logistics challenges, um, but on a technical standpoint, connectivity has definitely been the, the hardest part. It sounds like the energy infrastructure itself is kind of a big challenge. Maybe that's why we see so much mining in, you know, in the U.S. and Canada, for example, as they just have, you know, really built out transmission distribution networks, connectivity. So, so what what we struggle with, I think, is um, the the skill set of um, you know, like high voltage electrical engineers. 
Um, and so it's really challenging. You know, you go to a site, it's, it's, it's built professionally, um, the generation, all the cabling, you know, the transformers, uh, transmission infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, you know, but when it comes to, you know, putting 500 kilowatts or more, you know, into a 20 foot container, you gotta get things right. Um, and when you don't get things right, cables overheat, you know, bad things happen. Um, and so in a lot of these sites, they don't have necessarily that engineering uh, capability. Um, and so that's been one of the other challenges is finding resources. Uh, so w w when I meet a young kid and he's like, hey, you know, like what should I study? It's like electrical engineering. Like go, go study electrical engineering because there's, there's gonna be a lot of work for people that know that. Yeah, and certainly well, we're gonna come back to the workforce development piece and the kind of uh, you know, technical challenges, but maybe Ryan, you could talk a little bit, you know, you're, you're a nuclear guy, right? There are, at present, I think nuclear is responsible for something like 20% of global energy production. I imagine it's much lower across the African continent. You know, what's your vision for nuclear mining in Africa? Talk a little bit about you know, sort of what brought you to this panel. Yeah, well, Africa has been showing a great interest in developing nuclear power. There's at least a dozen countries across the continent that are starting the process to get into having nuclear infrastructure possibly by the end of the decade, maybe a little bit longer than that. Ghana is definitely at the top of that list. There was a massive conference held about a month ago with a joint uh, effort from the United States and a bunch of companies that are proposing SMR designs in, that, in their market to bring them into the Ghanaian market and ultimately further into the American market, or the African, wider African market. But like the SMRs like present like a world-changing energy technology that's like reaching maturity by the end of the decade. Like they're, they're more compact, they're cheaper, they're more efficient, they're much safer, they're going to have different uh, applications because they have a range of sizes from one megawatt to several hundred megawatts that can fit into different locations that wouldn't be uh, suitable for a large gigawatt size reactor like what was just built in the UAE. And it just opens up a lot more opportunities for deploying nuclear into markets where they only need 30 megawatts, they only need 60 megawatts. And then by applying Bitcoin mining as an anchor using a similar financing strategy to what Gridless is doing, that can facilitate and advance the process of bringing nuclear to Africa a lot sooner. So like most of these companies, they're applying for their licenses in established nuclear countries like Canada and the US and like Norway, Finland that have established regulatory bodies. So, but once these designs get licensed, it'll be much easier to start exporting them and deploying them to countries like Ghana. And then once that's been more established, we can go even further than just importing the technology. And like Ghana would be a magnificent place to host a manufacturing plant for these facilities to then further export them to the further south or further inland and like apply to many different uh, communities and locations. And especially one of them being uh, Bringing clean water resources and desalination is a huge benefit that nuclear power can uh, provide to these communities, and Bitcoin mining can absolutely help with that. Very uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to add that because on, on the point on the point of infrastructure, right? Typically, yes, we see all the miners going to the U.S. Um, because infrastructure is there. But just if if you blend out everything and if if you if you look at just that, right? It, Theoretically, you would think if there's a lot of infrastructure, it means a lot more power can be sold to other, other consumers that pay way more than Bitcoin miners could ever pay, right? So actually, if you look at the African continent and the problem it has with infrastructure, it makes it ideal for Bitcoin mining because there's so much stranded power as a result of the lack of infrastructure that exists. And what Ryan is proposing just adds to that problem. If you have small modular reactors, they pump out a lot of power in a very small space and that has to go somewhere. Um, and if it can't, then again, it's ideal for Bitcoin miners to come in and, and swoop up that power that otherwise nobody else can consume. So the, the point about stranded power is really interesting also because, you know, speaking as somebody who has works with a lot of US miners, they're not building out their own energy generating assets. They're, they're seeking out large, uh, you know, uh, utility scale, whether it be solar, wind, a lot of hydro, some nuclear now, and basically sopping up the excess power, right? 
but in the gridless model, you guys are actually developing these, you know, small, smaller resources for the most part, as I understand and, and, it. And, and I don't think you did this on purpose, but I'm not going to miss the opportunity. Uh, at 9.15 tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking about chasing cheap energy in Africa. Uh, so I invite everybody to come uh, listen to our perspective on how Bitcoin mining is not just a buyer of last resort, taking energy nobody else wants, but that Bitcoin mining is in fact also a buyer of first resort, being the first customer at a site to start taking that power. Well, so I'm going to throw it back to you because where I was going with this is the types of sources of energy, right, that you could develop using Bitcoin mining across Africa. Essentially, if we think about Bitcoin, a Bitcoin miner as a computer that converts electricity into money, that can tra transmit value across space and time, very exciting. Sounds magic. Sounds like magic internet money. Um, but if, you, if you're thinking about the types of assets that you're looking at across the continent to develop, right? obviously it's very sunny, it's, there's a lot of wind, there's geothermal, there's a lot of uh, hydro. Like, what are the most promising assets that you're looking at, both at the smaller scale? And I don't know, maybe uh, Jesse uh, and, uh, and Ryan, you guys can talk about sort of the utility scale. Like, what are those, some of those larger assets that could potentially come online as a result of Bitcoin mining? But, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think, and again, uh, this is part of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But um, you know, we're ch ch Bitcoin is always going to chase the cheapest source of energy. Um, and so when you look at, you know, particularly East and Southern Africa, and actually there's quite a bit here in West Africa as well, you know, run a river hydro like they're doing at Virunga um, is just an exceptionally cheap means of creating electricity. Um, solar is quite cheap to construct, um, but you, without storage, you can't actually run your Bitcoin miners more than a few hours. Um, and when you add in the cost of storage, it far exceeds, like you might as well just burn petrol, um, you know, cost wise. Um, we're really keen to look at some things like wind, uh, solar hybrids. Um, I think that could offer some interesting opportunities. Um, but by and large, I think, you know, at least the stuff that we're focused on will predominantly be, you know, similar to Barunga, run of, run of river hydro. Okay, so, and, and again, that, that smaller scale, you know. Oh, yeah, scale. like, you know, we're talking uh, five megawatts and below. Utility scale, I think one of the most exciting prospects right now is Ethiopia. It's, it's more and more people coming out of the, bu out of the bushes saying, like, hey, we have hosting opportunities and this and that. Um, because they've got the largest hydro dam on the African continent, six gigawatts, of which I think one, five, 15 percent is used. Tons of stranded power. They overbuild it because it's prestige projects um, for the next 40 years in the infrastructure bill that has to catch up. Um, and that's, that's where cheap power is. Currently, I think they have 90% hydro in their grid mix. The challenge there, though, is you have to now educate the local governments and the regulators to access that cheap power because they have no idea what you're talking about. And now you're asking them for a power purchase agreement, and they you know, have to pull a number out from somewhere. Um, and they don't know what to base it on, right? So now you're in that conversation of, hey, we're the only ones that can use it. Otherwise, it's lost. Would you rather make X or zero? Um, and that's, that's another conversation. And so for Ryan, you know, the, the timeline on building out a utility scale facility, especially nuclear, I mean, in the US, you know, it takes years and years and years. We just built our first nuclear facility in, I think, 30 years. And that's so correct. with SMRs, I understand it's, it's much faster. We've come a long way. But it seems like we're starting from scratch when it comes to the regulatory environment for something like, like nuclear. How, how do you expedite that? What is that going to look like uh, for building out SMRs in Africa? And how is Bitcoin mining going to play a role in there? Well, getting licensed in a country like Canada is definitely going to give these companies an advantage in deploying into Africa because that gives the local institutions the confidence that it's already been vetted by a highly reputable institution like the Canadian Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, but then, like, when you start thinking about the, like the size and the scale of these reactors. Like you can build them smaller, but then with Bitcoin mining, you can actually build them bigger sooner and the economics actually start working out much better because you can have a much higher capacity factor for both your power plant and for your Bitcoin miners. So then they can pay off themselves much sooner. And the other b benefit that nuclear has over all of the other competing technologies is it's pretty much location independent. Aside from like fault lines, you can, 
you can site a nuclear reactor basically anywhere. So well, whereas with plant. the hydro plant, it has to be where you have the hydro resources. Where you build the solar and wind farms, it has to be where those resources are available and abundant. And typically, they're in the middle of nowhere, far away from where the people that actually consume that power is. So at least with a SMR, you can locate the power where it's needed and minimize the amount of transmission that's required. And then you anchor with the Bitcoin miners, and then they can generate revenue that builds out the infrastructure as the community develops into their new power capacity. It, interesting, and you know, it sounds like there's a lot of parallels between nuclear energy technology and Bitcoin, at least from like a sort of public perception uh, perspective. <laughs> and so I wonder for, for the folks that are actually mining in the continent, like how are you engaging with regulators, with power operators? Is that like a difficult conversation to have? Is there a lot of you know, FUD? Is there a lot of misunderstanding? You know, wh wh where is the baseline you're starting at, and then how do you get to them to the point where they understand this is a solution to a problem they have? You know, I think Maybe. it's uh, <clears throat> yeah. There's there's plenty of fud um, in the in the beginning. Uh, I would say that at least with the um, energy generation and uh, regulator in Kenya, the first time we took them to a Bitcoin mining side, it was uh, Ob uses the expression their minds melted, <laughs> and literally their minds melted. Because um, it just isn't conceivable to them, you know, when they hear this idea of a machine that you pump energy into and it magically makes money, um, there's just no way to conceive of what that looks like. And so to see that it's, you know, well designed, it's, it's well implemented, it's well, well operated, uh, that was a big deal. But, but I think that there's an interesting dynamic in um, certainly African countries that have an abundance of renewable resources. Um, is that governments often put themselves in a really bad position that they enter into contracts, you know, to get foreign companies to come in and build, you know, like a big wind farm in northern Kenya, as an example. Um, and they end up with contracts that kind of force them to take that energy at the expense of cheap geothermal energy that we happen to have in abundance. Um, and so there's, you know, actually a, a, an active ongoing conversation about, like, how do we make how do we do a better job of using all of our energy resources as a country? Um, and part of that is keeping everything kind of at maximum. Um, and, you know, if the wind's blowing, that's great, then we're going to mine more Bitcoin. You know, if the, uh, if the wind's not blowing, then we'll turn off the Bitcoin miners and we'll use the geothermal. Um, and, and I think that, I really do think there's a tremendous potential, particularly in African countries, for us to work with the national generation national distribution and, and the energy regulators um, to integrate Bitcoin mining to bring more efficient and a more stable grid to those, to those countries. So I, I have two last points because I know we're, we're short on time. Um, <laughs> it says time up. <laughs> yeah, time up. <laughs> um, it's the last one, who cares? So, so a last kind of uh, uh, question and then this maybe leading to your final thoughts and, and advice for, for those out there that want to either start mining Bitcoin here in the continent um, this governance piece and this kind of foreign influence is, is really interesting, right? You know, the, the African continent has an insane amount of renewable energy potential, it's really cheap power, and I know that talking to Bitcoin miners, you know, the industrial scale companies that build, you know, hundreds of megawatt size sites, gigawatt sites, you know, they're looking at the continent, they're saying, hmm, that's a lot of cheap power that I can come in and use. There now is like a governance question, how do you ensure that if and when they do come in, they do it in a way that's responsible, that they're actually working with local stakeholders, that they're not just taking resources, you know, in a kind of colonization 2.0 type of way, uh, if I can coin the term. Um, so how, how do you ensure that they're actually adopting those best practices? And then after that, if you guys can just leave your thoughts before we take questions, you know, what is, what is your advice to those out there that want to start mining Bitcoin? Is that to me? <laughs> yeah, why don't we start with you, Phil? Yeah, okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so I think the first thing that, um, and, and you know, I, I mean, we've, we've been building uh, tech companies in Africa for a very long time, um, and, it's, and it's common that you see Western countries come in and not really want to understand the uh, social and cultural uh, nuances of, of doing business. Um, and so I think that there, there is a risk, you know, if, if uh, big mining companies come in and just kind of, you know, by force of will, um, you know, put, put themselves in that situation. Thankfully, you know, we're seeing that there's a willingness by the large, you know, international mining, the public mining companies to actually enter into a dialogue and say, hey, you know what, Africa scares the hell out of us. 
uh, you know, would you work with us to, to figure out the dynamics on the ground? Like we know how to run 100 megawatt, uh, 100 megawatt mining sites, but we don't have the slightest clue about how to, to deal with the dynamics on the ground. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping happens go, going forward is that, you know, um, as you, I think most of you guys know, we have GAMMA, the Green African Mining Alliance. Um, there's a great community of African miners, uh, Seb, Siambola, uh, Nemo in Ethiopia. Um, and so I, what I'm hoping is that as these big companies come in, that they engage with the local partner on the ground that actually knows Bitcoin mining, um, but that that ends up being the bridge that ensures there is uh, not just an economic benefit to the miner, but also a benefit to the community and, and, uh, and the countries they're operating in. I, I love that. We'll make that happen. Um, if you guys want to also offer your, your final thoughts, advice to folks out there that want to start mining Bitcoin, whether here in Ghana or across the continent, yeah, I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts. Um, so just on the, on, the, on the colonizer piece, um, I think there's, if power is cheap enough, that can't happen. Right? If, if a big industrial miner comes to Ghana or to Kenya or whatever, and they, they need cheap power and they can access it, and let's say the government gives it to them or the regulator, whoever, um, that power is only cheap because nobody else wants it. And as soon as they come in and buy it, it means they're doing something for the grid because they need it, they're consuming power that otherwise nobody else is, is buying. Right? So I think there's an inherent, inherent um, partnership there that, that can't really be exploited in that, in that same sense. I, I don't know if I totally agree with that, but maybe on the sidelines we can, cool. we can get into it. All right, and on the, on the other piece, I mean, just get in touch with, with uh, what Phil just said. Get in touch with Gamma if you want to get started mining, uh, if you need ASICs, if you need advice, if you um, need people to speak to, like, because you have questions of how to get started and, and, and stuff like that. Just write a message on Twitter or wherever and, and get the conversation going. I think that's the best first step. Thank you, Jesse. Ryan. Yeah, like, uh, like to reiterate that just re pulling stuff, stuff off like this is gonna require significant collaboration across a whole range of stakeholders, whether it's in policy, industry, capital investors, and especially the local communities, because they're gonna have to actively work together to shape the regulatory frameworks and encourage the innovation, and then pr pr also promote like responsible environmental stewardship, because investing in affordable, abundant power infrastructure is an investment of the people of these nations, and like now in four generations. So like we have an opportunity to seize the momentum of what's happening in the nuclear industry right now and like really transform Africa's energy landscape and set an example for the entire world. Thank you, Ryan. And Phil, yeah, you you know, I, uh, I'm gonna take one more opportunity to make a pitch, which is um, uh, we just had the first uh, African Bitcoin mining summit in Nairobi. Um, and uh, yeah, we had like, yeah, it, I, like honestly, it was, uh, it was just such an exceptional event to have miners talking about mining problems and how, how to do it better. Um, uh, Nemo will be hosting uh, the next one in uh, Addis uh, next year. Um, so, you know, I, I really do hope that people that are, that are serious um, about looking at how Bitcoin mining can be a catalytic enabler for you know, the development of new energy, um, you know, the financial sustainability of small mini grids and other distributed, you know, energy projects um, that you'll reach out to Gamma. That's where you would get the information from. So gamma.org, G-A-M-A.org. Uh, but then join us, you know, for the second annual African, huh? Yeah. huh? Oh, sorry, gamma.africa, uh, second annual next year, so. Amazing. And uh, do we have time to take questions from the audience? I don't know if... No, no time. Paul, no? No. <laughs> time up. <laughs> time up. Your time has been off since 10 minutes ago. Sorry. Round of applause for that, ladies and gentlemen.